Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash Ask Psych Sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash Ask Psych Sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thank you so much for joining us today. My guests are plural, which is uh, not always usual for this podcast. And further, they're from different disciplines. So today, I'm uh, very grateful to have Drs. Irene Lopez and Simon Garcia from Kenyon College in Ohio, my home state. Um, Dr. Lopez is from the psych department and Dr. Garcia is from the chemistry department. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Before we get started, it's always helpful for listeners to hear a little bit about uh, you and what you teach and what your training is. Um, and so I am going to start with our new to the podcast Department of Chemistry. Uh, Simon, would you tell us a little bit about your background and what you teach at Kenyon? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Simon Garcia. My pronouns are he, him, and L. And I am an associate professor of chemistry at Kenyon College, as you said. Um, I'm also the chair currently, which sounds impressive to people who are not in academia, um, but it's not. Um, you want to know about my background. I'm not sure how far back to go, but I'll just say that I was trained as a materials chemist, emphasis in inorganic materials and uh, physical chemistry. Um, and I started teaching here in two, 2006. I think 2000, yes, 2000, definitely 2006. And what are the names of your classes for those of us that might be advising students that want to have a chemistry minor and we want to lean them in your directions? Oh, right. <laughs> yes. I'm so used to saying that I teach chemistry and people being pretty much um, having heard as much as they really want to hear about it. Um, but yes, I can go to, into the details. I, um, I mean, I teach across the curriculum, but mostly I teach at the introductory level. Um, I direct our, our laboratory courses and the, the curriculum for that. Um, and whenever I can, I teach um, computational chemistry at the upper level. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and now for classes that I'm going to guess will sound slightly different. Um, Irene, would you share a little bit about your uh, training background and what you're teaching at Kenyon, please? Sure. Um, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. I say that I'm a clinical cross-cultural psychologist because that's my area of specialty. I think I came to Kenyon in 2007. I don't quite remember. Um, I was recently promoted to full. Um, yay! And um, so the joke I have is I teach everything but dance. So I teach in psychology. I contribute to the Latinx concentration that I co-founded. My courses count toward um, law and society, global learning. I think we have an initiative kind of going on. So um, just kind of lots of different things. But in psych, um, it's abnormal psychology are the big ones and cross-cultural psychology are the courses that I typically teach. Great. Thank you. Um, so I asked you to be on this podcast um, after you. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I apologize. But yeah. um, before I go further, I did want to take a moment to address the fact that I, Irene and I have the positions and livelihood that we do at Kenyon College. Uh, the college exists because it was built mm -hmm. on ancestral homelands mm -hmm. of indigenous peoples. Um, being scholars and teachers, we feel that we have a responsibility to examine um, how this act of land appropriation shaped the college and the world we have today and, you know, everything that we do associated with the college. Um, so I just want to, like, give a little bit of background. Um, the Treaty of Granville. Uh, in 1795, which was disputed, um, but nevertheless, it was um, implemented by the U.S. government. It created a legal framework for U.S. settlers to forcibly remove and then harass um, indigenous peoples from this entire region that we now call Ohio. Um, at that particular time, this included uh, people that we know of as uh, Mia Mia, Lenape, 
Wienda and Shani. Um, so this treaty, this event, cleared the way for Kenyan and other colleges to later settle on this land throughout the 19th century without opposition. Um, in addition, although Kenyan was founded in 1824, Black students did not enroll here until 1949. So if you're doing your math, that's over 100 years. Um, in addition, female students could not enroll here until 1969. Um, I, you know, I think I can I speak for Irene when I say that we both feel it's important to remind ourselves of um, this background in all of the work that we do, especially in the context of this project. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Simon. Um, Simon and I have had ongoing conversations about our role here at Kenyon, um, often wondering what are we doing here at Kenyon and how do we do Kenyon and how do we keep our sanity? Um, Kenyon's a really wonderful place. It's been very supportive. It's a, it's a warm, inviting place. Um, but at the same time, as I'm sure we'll sort of talk um, it can feel a little isolating, um, particularly being a faculty of color. And so talking about the land acknowledgement really kind of centers. I mean, it, and I know definitely for me, it helps remind me um, what, um, how lucky I am to be here and also the consequences, right, of um, the land being taken away. And just sort of thinking about um, the larger picture of the um, underrepresented faculty kind of uh, in academia and underrepresented folks in academia in general. So thanks, Simon. That was super thoughtful. Yes, I, I second the thanks. Um, in some ways, that's perhaps an even better segue um, to what we're going to talk about, right, which is about um, underrepresented, historically and currently excluded identities um, we talk a lot about those in our students and in classrooms on this podcast, and not maybe as much from the angle that you two are working on, which is about when the professor is holding these identities and what that means and what to do to make it, I think, as you both just alluded to, like, how do we hold these spaces at the same time? We are working in institutions that are on, I cannot do a quality land acknowledgement for Seen Hall University other than to say, yes, we are also on lands um, I believe of the Lenape people and possibly others. Um, so yeah, what are what are you two doing about this right now, both for yourselves and for your broader academic community? And I will just pause and you two can use visual cues to decide who wants to take the first shot at the question, please. So I'll I guess the the way to start is just to talk about how um Simon and I kind of came up with our idea. So we have a website for um, faculty of color that we got funded to do. But if we take a few steps back, like how did that even come about? How are we even having these conversations? And um, I just I just remember uh, Simon and I kind of visiting each other during lunch hour and just saying, can I talk to you? <laughs> like, I just, I have to just decompress, right? And um, what just happened, we'll stay, we'll stay here in this room. And, and as we talked, we realized um some of the same experiences that we were having. And also we began to kind of independently look at the research on um, faculty of color, underrepresented faculty, and seeing a lot of the same issues that we were sort of just having informal conversations um, echoed. Um, so I think this just began as just reaching out to another person and saying, hey, are you feeling this? And, and I mean, am I crazy or yeah. I don't know, Sam. What, what do you, what do you think? I mean, you know, I am crazy, but whatever. Well, well, I second, I second that. You know that that um, just how important it is to convince yourself that you're not crazy. Yeah. Sometimes because we're, you know, I feel that we're often socialized to believe that um, if something isn't right, it's your own fault. Mm -hmm. Um, I try not to go. I, mean, I don't want to take up too much time with anecdotes, but. I'm just reminded of a student who approached me. Um, she was taking introductory chemistry and she, she approached me to say that she didn't know how to study, which is a, kind of came out of the blue like that. And you know, I was a little skeptical. I said, you know, you, you got to Kenyon, I'm pretty sure. 
you know how to study. But then she came up with all sorts of, of reasons why she wasn't doing well in her class because of herself. Like she automatically blamed herself. Um, he blamed her school, which was under-resourced. He blamed her own lack of background because she didn't take that much chemistry in high school. But I tried to dig in and ask, what are the cues that cause you to think you're not, you don't understand the chemistry, that it's your fault? And, and I began with the questionnaire. Do you do the readings? And she said, yes, professor gives me readings. I do the readings. I asked, do you answer the discussion questions, like the, the prep questions? And she said, yes, I answer them all. And I said, and in class, do you talk about those, your answers with other students? She said, yes, I do that too. So I said, by all accounts, that is called studying. She said, but I'm pretty sure that it's not, that I'm not doing it right because when I go into class and we get into groups, everyone ignores me. Mm -hmm. And after querying her a little bit, it became clear that the reason why people were ignoring her is because they didn't think she knew anything, even though we did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was, it was, for a moment, I just, you know, I, I said, oh, uh, Karina, like, <laughs> this is not you. This is... Um, discrimination. And she replied saying, that's not possible. It can't be. Because the professor in the syllabus said this would be an inclusive classroom. And so she'd taken that instructor's aspiration as a promise. Um, I'm sorry, this is a long anecdote, but it, it's something that comes back to me over and over again when I see how people, um, particularly students and faculty of color, blame ourselves for yeah, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to pick it back on what you're saying, Simon. So, I mean, I think it's really telling, right, that the student comes to you because there was something about you that the student felt comfortable approaching, right? Um, so being a uh, faculty of color, um, it could be that she thought, well, I want to talk to him about studying, um, but that you were helping her to sort of to, you know, try to figure out what's kind of going on and that you were able to name right? What was happening? These kind of conversations between students and faculty, or particularly between underrepresented students and underrepresented faculty, I mean, these things, these discussions of discrimination, or like, what can you do? Um, it's not to say that they don't happen with like white faculty, I, you know, they can and they do. But the research shows that when you have faculty of color, they're much more likely to approach these topics, probably more often, um, more upfront, right? Um, than um, other like non-minoritized uh, faculty. And the research also shows that students of color feel seen and heard, but also white students feel like they can kind of broach these topics. And so these are the kind of conversations that Summer and I were kind of having kind of informally, like, you know, what do you make of when X student says Y or Z? Or even like, what do you make about um, your own teaching um, I know that I became interested in this issue. So, so Kenyon is uh, um, really puts a lot of emphasis on quality teaching. We have amazing teachers here, and we are constantly having like workshops, right, on how to improve our teaching. And I remember many years ago having a, a workshop that was really talking about how do we get students to talk, particularly students who, you know, from um, historically underrepresented backgrounds who, who may not talk, you know, things like that. Um, and they started talking about, you know, um, cultural interactions between students. And there was this assumption that those cultural interactions were only occurring between the white professor and the students of color. And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> so like, there are like really important dynamics that are happening between students, between faculty of color and white students, right? And and Simon and I kind of looked at literature and, and there are like one or two articles, but they just didn't seem to be a space where all of that stuff was together. Um, and that was the inspiration for the website that we created. And those are just some of the anecdotes, right? Not even, we don't have enough time to do all of them. Um, I do want to go and talk about the website, but if I could just pull one thing from your uh, anecdotes, uh, Simon, that I think is super important for listeners of this podcast that have language about inclusive teaching in their syllabus, because that is such a telling example. 
that students trust us that when we say that, we've done what we're supposed to do. But I think sometimes it's in your syllabus and you don't go back or you don't talk about it or you don't, because that's not, I'll be honest, like that's not something that I've thought about in my classes. And I do a lot of small group work. So everyone take a note after spring break, I'm going to be walking around and making sure that everyone's voices are being heard because what a hurtful situation for that student to be in and not feel empowered for how to deal with it or talk about it. And I would hope that if you ask those students if they were doing it, this is an implicit bias, right? Not an explicit, hopefully, but they could make their implicit explicit and then and then use cognitive control to change their responses. So do you, either of you want to sort of say something about, um, in some ways, I think of that, that it's almost more hurtful to do that, right? If your professor puts, this is my classroom is inclusive in the syllabus and then doesn't do the actions, it would be better not to have it in the syllabus at all so that you're not setting an expectation that doesn't get met. So if either of you have sort of thoughts about that piece, I would I would like to hear them. Uh, I guess um, before addressing that sort of directly, I, I would say it's also a missed opportunity for that professor because we've talked about this, right? Simon and I have talked about, you know, we're drawn to Kenya and we're drawn to places like this. We're drawn to teaching because we love students. Um, and so I'm sure that that professor was passionate, right, about their topic, um, but there was a an oversight, like you know, and and um, that was a missed opportunity for that professor, right, to sort of address that and to to bring to life that kind of inclusive teaching. And that's the thing, right? And you're exactly right. Like you can't just have it in the syllabus and then just you don't go back to it. And this whole idea is going to be like a process. And then we haven't even talked about when. Um, when cultural diversity goes sideways right, in the classroom, which is also a conversation in some way, I've had, had conversations like we we have felt that we haven't really been mentored on underrepresented faculty about how we deal with that too. But yeah, Simon, I don't know if you want to add anything. Oh right, I, I mean I, I I agree. Yeah, that. It can be harmful if you are focusing on the the message but not the action. Um, I mean, yeah, but and, and actually, maybe what I would add is that um, you know, for people who know about my teaching, um, I think that people have assumed that I never encounter any kind of conflict or um, or bias in my classroom, and the truth is, I do, and it's usually a sign that something's going, or I should say. I interpret it <laughs> as a sign that something's going right, that a student, especially if a student comes to me and says, I had an experience um, in the classroom. Most commonly, it is a white female student who was working in a group with um, a uh, male, usually international student of color, and um, her views were just ignored. Um, because of like of an implicit um, bias, and so that the student felt comfortable to raise this um, to me sounds like that um, through my actions I've managed to establish some sort of some sort of trust. That you know, in other words, it's I, I try to think of it as like car accidents. We don't go out trying to cause them, but we do know what to do when we get into what we should mm. know what, what what to do when we get into a car accident, and just expect that it will happen, you know, statistically at some point in your life. And I think these are really powerful teaching moments, right? Um, and my sense is that sometimes peers may not, professors, for example, may not, may see something happening. Let's, let's assume, right, the worst case scenario, professors always going on and, and didn't touch it. The professor is uncomfortable talking about this. Um, but that's a missed opportunity, right? That's a missed opportunity for teaching. And the other thing too is that, uh, and, and Simon again, and I have talked about this, how we both teach areas, I was in, as an area area, that's very content heavy, right? You're teaching intro psych, you wanna get through all your stuff in intro psych, and that's really important, but we can't forget that teaching isn't just the depositing of content, it's gonna be process, right? And we're modeling that. So, it's going to be really important to to talk about what just happened kind of in the classroom, that sense of disclosure. And the research actually also shows that faculty of color are much more likely to use disclosure, splitting kind of like, you know, further the, the classroom learning. 
Thank you. Thank you both. Um, maybe it would be good to talk a bit more about this website um, for our listeners to use as a, a resource um, either to help support their own faculty, but also I'm guessing would be helpful um, for people that don't identify in a you know historically marginalized and excluded group to better understand the experience of their colleagues and try to make it more enjoyable right or reduce the the hoops uh, or just be more comfortable as i always say like I'm, i may not prevent every mistake but at least hopefully my colleagues are comfortable saying making it so that it, i'm receptive to their feedback for when i'm making mistakes so, yeah yeah irene you look like you want to share a bit about the website please. i was actually looking for the the title of the website i don't have it in front of me <laughs> so I, just, I wonder if you can get through that <laughs> i have it and I assume this will be in the um, podcast notes. Yes, it will um, be in the show just, notes. But I'll just spell it out um, also um, that it's uh, just all one word, uh, faculty of color network. So the words faculty of color network, all strung together, uh, dot com. And it's, um, I, I'll, I'll just give like a outline of it and then Irene can um, hopefully... The things that I've forgotten because I will forget something. Irene, please like, <laughs> help me fill it in. Um, but I think it's essentially a, an anna- a collection of, of papers, of, of um, primary sources, um, about research on faculty of color. So that's the first thing that it is. But it's also like a call to action. It's we envisioned um, kind of two different ways that someone might use this. The first is, um, as we talked about, just uh, telling other faculty of color that they're not crazy. (laughs) Um, That research exists, that scholars have already looked at this. Of course, there can be more done, but that research is is underappreciated, I think, because people don't know about it. But also we envisioned that maybe administrators or leaders leaders for faculty development would also take a look at this so that they are informed about this research and about the kinds of things that could or could not, you know, may or may not be happening within their own institutions. Um, Like every institution is different, but at least if you have some examples of the kinds of things that people have studied, then you will be aware of it and primed to, to deal with it and detect it within your own institution. Um, we also have like a, a content analysis to kind of like an overview of um, what the findings are essentially when you look at um, all of these sources together, like some, some themes arise in them. So, so that's mostly what the, what the website is. Um, I'll, I'll just step back and let Irene uh, correct me if I, if I missed anything. Oh, you didn't. You, um, I just, I'll add to what you said. It was really on point. So first, the the website came about as a way of finding a place to put all of this in one spot. Um, My my idea for the website also was that I wanted to create a place where where faculty are under review, (laughs) right, can look at the research and see what it says. So for example... We know that the research as a faculty of color are often involved uh, more than their uh, white faculty in interdisciplinary programs, and they do more service. Um, in part, faculty are rec- faculty of color recruited to diversify the pool. They diversify the pool. They make a strong impact on their students. But as I often like to joke, you can't write a paper when you're talking to a student or talking to anyone, right? So it comes at a cost at times to other things. Um, and I wanted to create a place where uh, faculty could see the research that says, yes, this does happen, right? This isn't like some intrinsic failure on your part. And when you come up for a review, you know, and you talk about all the interdisciplinary stuff that you've been doing. First of all, track that stuff um, and cite the work that says how valuable this this stuff is. Cite the work that says, actually, this can count as service. Consider increasing your, if you can, your contract to include more service, you know? And so I, you know, we had talked about kind of creating a, a resource so people can, uh, just can find solace and support um, should they kind of come up for review. And also that action plan, I think, was also really important. 
um, that institutions can kind of look at is, you know, tenure and promotion committees can, can look at this and say, what does actually research say, you know, about this? How can we be more um, aware uh, of the of these things? Yeah. Yeah, the layers, right? When you really think about the layers that stack and not just, again, right? Experimental psychologists, right? So I always think about interactions of magnitude, right? So it's like, more time with students. We know that names impact how reviews happen, right? So if it's not double blind, or we know that people, uh, you know, like in psychology, like may not think about an interdisciplinary journal in the same way we think about our work, right? I've had people on here talking about qualitative research as research too. Um, So yeah, once you stack all of those pieces together, it really is not it's not the same, right? This, uh, you know, fairness doesn't become fair if we are What's so interesting hand. because I think there's a lot of recruitment. You know, we we um, want to bring in a diverse workforce. Uh, we want to have a different way right, of doing things. And then folks come on board and they do things different. And they're like, mm, you're doing it different. <laughs> it's like, well, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's also something that Simon and I talked about. Like, I, I think that we basically kind of created our own kind of posse, right? Like a, a, a support group kind of go through this yeah no that is that's great right and then how do we make sure like i said that then we don't because there's also the um the workload piece of we need it so that people that don't have these identities can sit on committees and reliably represent needs interests and concerns until we get sufficient numbers for that right i think that's the other place where you know, it's not just the student service work. It's like every time there's a committee, they're like, oh, this committee is not looking, not looking so good. But I, if I can only call Irene and Simon, like you can't just spend all day in committee meetings, making, checking people I to make sure. so, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, great. Well, I hope people will go check out facultyofcolornetwork.com. Did I get it right? Uh, And I'll put that in the show notes. Um, But we are, I think, you know, right on our kind of keeping it 15 to 30 minute episodes. If you like the long form podcast, those drop on the other Tuesdays. Um, So I do, though, like to make space for people to talk about something that um, they didn't get to that they think is important, whether it's directly related to this or something else, keeping in mind that these are mostly um, teaching psycholo- uh, psychology teaching faculty that will be listening to the podcast. Um, since I had Simon introduce um, themselves uh, yourself first, I'll flip over to Irene and I'll let Simon close this out. Um, hmm. Well, I guess A number of folks have sometimes asked us, like, why are we doing this? Like, why don't so much of the stuff has been on, like, students? Um, and I think that we wanted to do this because we we believe in inclusive teaching. And inclusive teaching means giving the tools to reach out to students, but also giving the tools to the professors um, themselves. Um, there has been a little bit of work about um, when folks of color are teaching diversity uh, related courses and, you know, how difficult that can be. And I think that's really important. But I also, we need, we need to sort of think about um, kind of structurally too, like what can institutions do um, to bring cohorts, right, of um, underrepresented faculty uh, to teaching. Um, and that also that, um, when tenure and promotion committees, for example, review materials, that they are aware of this issue of something Simon and I have talked about is at being at once highly visible and being invisible, mm-hmm. right? So being highly visible, everybody knows you as the faculty of color, sometimes the only one in the department, and yet being invisible with regards to kind of your contributions um, to the department, college, or whatever. Um so I guess my I, the, the thing I like to kind of end with is that um, the reason I think that we're that well I'm, I'm interested in this is I think it makes for good teaching. It, it's, it makes for a students kind of learning kind of in different ways and in deeper ways. And I think it's just at the end of the day, it's about what kind of teaching can we provide for our students. So yeah. Thank you. Simon, is there anything you would like to share? Well, I guess I want to share my gratitude and appreciation for, um, I guess, some 
people and organizations we haven't mentioned. So um, some of the work um, that went behind the website was funded by the uh, by CHAS, the Consortium on High Achievement and Success. Uh, they they gave us a grant to um, actually collect the materials, curate them, and then create the website, um, as well as um, some early work by students. Um, like I guess in all cases, they were psychology students who contributed to this. So um, Alejandra Comunares uh, was kind of the first student who did some, uh, there was some quantitative research on survey data, but she also like um, did some early surveys of the literature and helped bring um, some of the general themes to our attention. And then Shanti Silver uh, did, um, did some excellent modeling work on Kenyan specific mm -hmm. data from, from Coach. Um, so I just want to like shout out to them because um, who, for all I know, since they uh, were psychologists or psychology uh, majors, they probably are listening to this at some point, maybe. Um, and so I want to shout out their their contributions to this work. One one more thing, if I may. So a, a shout out to our mentor, uh, Rick Sheffield. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we had a uh, provost um when we first came, who would have what he would call the other lunch. So it was for faculty who identified other and, you know, you can interpret that however you will. And actually, Simon, a lot of these conversations happen at the other lunch. Um, so yeah. the roots of this are actually, they go way, way back. So thanks, Rick. That's great. Um, speaking of thanks, I want to thank both of you um, for your time and for the work that you've done on the website and sharing it uh, with our listeners. So today I have been uh, having the privilege of talking to Dr. Irene Lopez and Simon Garcia from Kenyon College. Take care. Listeners, did today's episode make you realize you have a question you would like someone to answer? I would be happy to take it into consideration and find a guest that can help. But what I need you to do is head over to our Google form at bit.ly slash ask psych sessions.